The mining industry is going through a major shift in how to power the mine. There's a move from fossil fuel based operation to electric operation, and it's happening for a variety of reasons. A few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Michael Boland, a Cisco mining expert, and he walks through what's happening with this energy transition and why Cisco is relevant to the conversation. Buckle up, he gets right into it. Here's my conversation with Michael. So welcome to the, to the virtual mining summit. Um, more virtual for you, I guess, because, uh, because we're recording this. Just as a bit of background, um, for the audience, we've uh, we've been talking a little bit about what mining customers are going through with the energy transition and so much um, you know movement towards uh, electrification of all kinds of processes, including vehicles. Um, and uh, and maybe let's start with what do you see kind of happening in mining in the area of kind of mine power modernization? Is probably a good way to put it. Yeah, well, there's a lot to cover. Um, well, maybe at a start at the macro level, right? At the macro level, what we're seeing or what I'm seeing globally is there's incredible focus on scope one, scope two emissions. Um, compliance, ESG responsibilities with governments and shareholders uh, and, and, and financing. Uh, where do I get my financing for this new mine or this upgrade as well? So they're all coming in at number one, I would believe. And the primary function in mining will be cost optimization and operational cost reduction always. But now a new opportunity is giving them the ability to look at this problem and then saying, how can I leverage this for optimization? So can I bring in more renewable energy stream into my mix and can I cut my costs as a result? especially as a result of right. global supply chain disruption just happening recently around the world. People are going back and looking at risk, risk management, and uh, the risk of energy, uh, energy futures. Um, and then overall, it looks to a blended mix of renewable energies with current supply of energy into my production mix, even to the point of changing the production systems themselves. Um, yeah, are you the main ones at a macro level? <clears throat> do you see this as um, do you see this as mining companies wanting to move to um, to cleaner energy in their mines, or is this um, or is this being driven more by cost reduction, or or is it just kind of a dance between the two that is just happening right now? Oh, I think it's a complex mix. I look genuinely yeah. if you look at the, the charter of any mining company. They exist at the capability of being able to get access to mining leases um, and governments are involved. And being large organizations where shareholders, shareholders are involved. And right. now, if we now look to scope three trans, uh, emissions, uh, we look at interesting capability where the downstream customer is interested in saying, how are you going to help me? Uh, produce a product that I need to take to market for the same reason. So I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's a mixture of all. But it, at its okay. core, yeah. if you look at it, it's mining companies with uh, a responsibility to communities in which they mine, uh, not to poison the environments, not to jeopardise that, to have commitments to governments, um, not just for uh, revenue, but also compliance. Uh, to then be seen as part of the solution rather than being seen as part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And also there's opportunity here. You know, a lot of the mining industries are reallocating to look to tap into the market which renewable energies generate by themselves, battery technologies. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the, the current boost in uh, mining metals, right? Uh, this, is, this is all right. coming into play. But well, let's, let's look a little bit at that. that it's kind of the main trends that you're observing in this transition um, yeah. that's happening, maybe being led by the energy, but obviously there's a lot of connected parts to that. What are some of the main trends you're seeing companies do right now? Oh, gee, there's lots, lots happening. So if we look at what's happening with energy, um, we need, we're looking at seeing people looking at changing uh, the cost model of their energy. 
So supplementing existing energy supply, maybe I'm on grid, uh, and they need to expand. Many uh, organizations are trying to expand their operations. By definition, it's very rare that we have mines. There are exceptions, of course, that are close and adjacent to major cities where access to high voltage uh, supply lines is, is easier. But when we're in remote, re rural, regional, remote environments, I might, not, I might be at the end of the grid. I'm going and asking uh, the utilities to say, can you upgrade my supply? And they're saying, well, I'm actually busy with uh, distributed energy resources of my own, and I've got major capital expenses coming up. So the cost numbers that are coming up are uh, making mining companies look at saying, well, maybe if I supplement my energy costs uh, with uh, renewable energies, and that's a full gamut, by the way. It's not one thing. Uh, solar and wind come to mind, but some yeah. mines have access to hydro uh, electricity, local hydro. Um, and it's not necessarily displacing, or it's not being a total replacement yet for uh, fossil fuels, although mining companies are looking and doing those models. So it's a supplementary. But the big impact, I think, is it's happening multifold. It's... Um, it, it, mining companies re-looking at their mining process and re-optimizing for a variable energy mix. We have mining companies looking and saying, you know, I have ball mills right at the moment and their continuous duty cycle. I run for weeks or months before I take them down for yeah. maintenance. If I bring in uh, more uh, variable energy into the mix, uh, I may not be able to run those mills. Maybe I might change to a different mill type, like a roller mill or something oh, that came out right. of the cement industry, uh, which is more batch oriented. And maybe I can spin that up, spin that down. So we're looking at entire changes here in mining process. And of course, taking that in, into concern, if you go in and look at the, the mine operations, what do we see? Uh, open pit mining has always been looking at the difference between haulers for uh, taking ore out of pit versus conveyors, always been the case. But now we're starting to see people saying, well, if I move to, a, to another renewable source, two types come to play right at the moment, those experimenting or mainlining with uh, batteries, battery uh, haulers, large haulers, conventional, and then others with hydrogen whether they produce it uh, on site, okay. electrolyzers, or bring it in. And then um, uh, some are even looking at saying, maybe I change the model completely and move to small fleet of, of haulers. Of oh, small yeah. Fleet. Yep. Right? And, and so is the that, dynamics are um, completely changing. Hmm. To what extent do you think hydrogen will be a factor here, right? Because um, th I guess that's another way to do it, is to bring the energy in with hydrogen or that's a viable model oh i think the models i think the models are all being worked out right at the moment the models that okay. are, are sound are definitely baseline renewable energy for solar and wind and any other form like uh, if you yeah. have it available to supplement my existing high voltage uh power sources that's common right that model works and modeled now when we get down to uh, changing fleet if we were to look at underground mining, uh, that transition is happening. Uh, Battery-operated vehicles on the ground make perfect sense. Uh, we can uh, uh, cut down on our ventilation costs uh, by basically not having exhaust emissions on the ground. I can um, uh, not have to do expensive fuel distribution systems on the ground. Also, with a major focus to safety as well. So in certain areas like underground mining, that trend is well understood. Now, when we get to above ground mining, when we're starting to look at, we are starting to see the full mix. We're seeing people introducing hydrogen to do hydrogen injection along in diesel or gas uh, and then supplementing and seeing that I get efficiencies. And I've seen some mines okay. in Indonesia, Indonesia do that. Then I see other mines like uh, Anglo-American Africa announce no full... Uh, hydrogen direct vehicles themselves on major haulers. Um, hmm. Now, I think the model is, is is being affected by do I bring in hydrogen or do I produce it on site? Goes back to the right. first issue is how much disposable energy do I have to be able to produce through the hydrolyze, uh, electrolyzers the hydrogen I have exactly. on site versus am I in a place where I have 
a good supply chain for compressed or um, uh, liquefied hydrogen, bringing it to site with a reliable supply chain. What I have seen in, uh, is happening here in Australia. We have uh, LNG uh, definitely feeding power generation, um, co-located themselves. But um, people are now looking and saying, well, maybe do I go and change that to hydrogen or that will be linked with other major hydrogen pro projects that may happen in the area for reliable infrastructure. What I do see right. is many miners are looking to the first supplement my power with uh, solar and wind on site, whatever resources make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what we're also seeing, remember, uh, as we seek out, as our high-grade ores deplete and I go further afield, I'm getting further and further away from where the grid is. So we're seeing greenfield mines look like they may skip completely and say, can I move and do modeling on a 100% renewable environment? Because I'm that far out Interesting. that just moving fossil fuels to where I am might be too costly. Maybe, maybe um, you touched on a bunch of this already, but maybe just mm. take us through kind of each piece of the mining plan from like you talked about greenfield mines just now and kind of talk about underground open pit and kind of through other parts like rail and haulage and ports and that kind of thing like what are the different aspects of each of those environments that that need to change with this energy transition idea well the very first thing i think is understand that we the power systems the energy management systems in a mine uh, are largely running as a uh, full, fully available on-demand source. Now, that's not in case for every mine. Many mines actually supplement with diesel generation today, um, definitely for backup, because sometimes power is unreliable to say. But if we look at a steady, uh, steady mode, it more looks like grid power, where I have power available, I draw down on that power, I'm doing processing and drawing on power. The power systems are separate and adjunct. If I bring more renewable energy into the mix, variable energy mix, I now have a different type of power model. I now need to uh, very closely couple my production demand with my ver uh, baseline, baseline supply plus my variable supply. Mm. So that talked to the part where I was talking about changes in mine design. You know, can I change yeah. my benefication plant uh, to more, be more variable in nature, which will complement my power generation sourcing capability? In the open so, pit so, mine, I'll go ahead. Mm. I was just going to say, so for greenfield mines, this could be a fundamental change in just the way they approach the, the mine design and, and life of mine completely, I guess, right? Yeah, for greenfields, like I said, in greenfields, people are looking at a new form of building a mine. Can I build a mine to, that actually runs on dominant or even 100% renewable sources? Wow. Um, okay. It will vary by your mine mix, your topology, the mine dynamics, of course. But that's definitely right. happening, especially the more remote you get, these come, come into play. Um, right. Sorry, I interrupted you there. You're talking about greenfield mines. You're moving to underground. So I'll, I'll let oh, no, you keep no, no, going no, here. No, Sorry no, about that. That's all right. But you mentioned life of mine, right? So the model yeah. then now is I run a mine for many, many years, right? It may take me four to eight years to get the mine up out of the into production, and then I might operate it for tens of years, tens of years, and decades, and then decommission. In the past, we looked at mining companies looking at how do they um, put the mine back into a state which is acceptable and feed it back, give it back to the community of the government in a way that's socially acceptable. Well, with the adjunct of renewable energy, if I'm building a renewable energy capability, maybe I can give back more than just a mine. I can give back a distributed energy resource for a local community, town or maybe feed the grid and be part of the new mix for distributed energy resources in the national grid. So these are all coming into play. So to be honest, it's really changing people's thinking and modeling. Yeah. Hmm. 
Now, if you want to go back and we look at the types of mines, like I said, yeah, open pit that. mines are looking at fleet operations and can I supplement that fleet with uh, basically it's electrification. Everything we talk okay. about is driving point to electrification one way, shape or form, whether it's uh, batteries on vehicle or whether it's uh, uh, using electri electrification to generate hydrogen with hydrolyzers to, to drive a, a vehicle. It's electrification one way, shape or form. So that's the open pit mine. Uh, underground, we talked about, you know, the move to battery vehicles, haulers, drills. Uh, underground is, it's complementary, right? Because um, power in a mine, uh, uh, getting uh, a, a very big power uh, consumer in an underground mine is ventilation. So if I can minimize that ventilation by not having an exhaust uh, underground, um, that minimizes that, uh, that large power uh, consumer. It adds to safety because I basically have less fumes and things underground. Uh, if I don't have fuel dispensing systems, uh, complex ones underground going many kilometers, um, then that not only is a capital expenditure cost that I save uh, versus stringing power lines, um, it's, a, um, it's also the ability to um, uh, improve safety as well without having to handle flammable liquids uh, in a in an enclosed environment. So there are complementary wins, and I think mm -hmm. you'll see very much uh, that the underground mining space is moving there quite quickly. Um, oh, what, what were the other ones you mentioned? Uh, so they talked about the minification plant. Well, oh, you talked about the transportation rail. systems. I know that you've got rail lines in some parts of Australia, um, yeah. uh, ports even, that mining companies uh, would operate, Port, right? Ports. Ports are typically close to uh, uh, major towns and therefore major um, power infrastructure. I think yeah. they will happen. I think they will happen with the same dynamics and cost dynamics, operation dynamics will affect them, but maybe not yet. What I do see is definitely in rail, um, definitely in Australia. Yeah. Uh, the iron ore miners here, all, all the majors have announced uh, battery uh, locomotives uh, to pull and haul their their wagons from mine to port. Now, of course, the dynamics of batteries versus um, conventional electrified rail um, has a lot to do with topology of the rail infrastructure, the geography okay. of the mine and what's required. But it's interesting to see uh, moving to a battery uh, train, right? Uh, battery locomotives. Right? So, um, again, so uh, electrification there too, yeah. Mm, interesting. Well, this has been a really great conversation um, uh, about all these things that are happening in the industry uh, around mining companies. But this is a, <laughs> this is a, a Cisco conference and we haven't really <laughs> talked about Cisco yet. Um, oh. Traditionally, I guess, where, where Cisco comes into play is just all the traditional communication systems and, and, uh, um, and really anything that requires uh, data gathering and data extraction from the, the mining environment. But I think what, what we've chatted about before is that this transition to, to um, more electrification actually opens up some other areas that Probably we're always there um, related to Cisco uh, relevance, but maybe not quite as important as they are now. Maybe talk a little bit about where it fits into this transition for mining companies. Yeah, how does the transition affect what Cisco can offer and where do we play? Right. Um, look, let's look go back to some of those points I touched on. Um, uh, with electrification, uh, a variable uh, source of power, I, I now need a generation on site. Uh, there may be a refit of the energy management. Well, there definitely will be a refit of the energy management system for definitely. The first uh, thing we see is a, a big push to IEC 61850 architectures. Uh, even if uh, EPC and EPCMs aren't necessarily driving it, uh, the power vendors themselves that supply the equipment for energy management systems default to that technology. Uh, so that's coming in as a retrofit to maybe long-held existing energy management systems. 
The other thing we talked about, more variable power linking with production, closer, uh, closer monitoring rather than just being a user of power where things could run in parallel. Uh, largely are now having a reactive system where process control network and the energy management systems need to work more aligned. So now we're starting to see more integration, definitely, of control systems themselves. So with that, a network level, IEC 61850 architectures, we have those for power and grid operators. The difference, though, is we have to adapt those directly into the places in mining because mining has a lot of the requirements the same, but we're all so different. So those uh, architectures need to be adapted for the mining environment. That's one. The next issue is as I bring in more integrated operations environments or uh, networking capability, ever more requirement on segmentation, security, right, and performance monitoring. Um, these things uh, are now come become more important. Mm. But Within talk a little bit about, ahead. you talked about, you mentioned 61850 a couple of times. Um, this, I think this is more uh, pretty well understood in the power world. Like if you work for a power um, power operator, like a, an electric grid, a utility, or, or even a power generating company, um, the 61850 architectures and standards within substations and that kind of thing would be very familiar to people. Talk maybe a little bit about that transition and how power companies have been transitioning to that and why that's now important to adopt in mining. Okay, well, the grid is a mixture of places as well, generation, distribution, and, and then um, the consumption uh, to, to, to the users. Mines do generate. Um, I have multiple right. of my customers generate centrally and distribute power themselves. Um, those systems started off with custom energy systems when the power plants were built for long life. Uh, but if we're built now, would be built to the same technology the grid operators work with. In the past, they would run, run over PDH or maybe SDH infrastructure interconnecting the power generation systems with the uh, high voltage distribution systems and then down to consumption. Um, those systems themselves are all migrating to MPLS networks in the, in the power industry. And the next evolution of that will be maybe MPLS segment routing. So we're looking at packet based technologies essentially, rather than a bit oriented time division multiplex technologies moving forward. That is what is at the essence of 61850. And then if you look at the high voltage distribution lines, so a, a, mine, a mine operator that produces power centrally may re-leverage the grid designs. Our CVDs for grid are very applicable there. When we get the high voltage distribution, we're not really distributing, although, you know, as I said, mines are all unique. Some mines actually distribute for towns, in which case all of that's relevant. Right, in which case they're yeah. actually distributing for the for the for the town or that the, they're near, um, but the uh, high voltage distribution definitely across the mine. Uh, those high voltage okay. distribution rooms will be all running on um, fiber optic networks, uh, fast convergent layer two infrastructure, um, very high uh, dependency on high resolution clocking. Right. They're all aspects of a 61850 design. Maybe the difference where we differ is in the reticulation. I'm not going to homes. I'm actually distributing underground. I'm uh, going into all the different facets of mining, a rock crusher, a benefication plant. Um, uh, and that's where we'll have to do the customization for the mining environment. Um, uh, but anyway, th so reference designs, technologies, uh, or aligning people are building products and Lego construction in that, that way. Uh, the mining industry is no different. It will inherit the benefits that are happening in the grid technology. Now, supplementing with that, there are a whole lot of renewable energy designs for how do you do solar arrays and wind farms. So we have wind farm designs and CVDs that have been developed with the uh, uh, the renewable generators and industries of how to do that. And then they come in and feed into those systems. So it's not as though mines have to start from a blank sheet of paper. It's never been done before. And there are specialist companies 
to just specialize in battery, I mean, uh, generation and storage capability, and then integrating that into as a variable uh, supply into a fixed or variable production mix. Yeah. So that's IEC 61A50. Um, and then um, what we see is the mining companies adopting uh, into their operation centers, whether they be on site or remote operation centers, the ability to integrate this uh, power um, control um, and variable monitoring for variable input, whether it be solar or wind, and bringing that into and closely aligning with production on the process control network itself. Right Now we start to see if I need to do common reticulation systems, how do I segment those systems, how do I let them talk between themselves where they need to, if they need to, what are the designs for doing that under the um, um, 62443 architectures, IEC standards right. for security and safety. And of course, underneath all of this is how do you build highly resilient, highly available infrastructures because... It all rides on the network, right? The network it needs to be there. It needs to be able to support all the demand requirement of these new systems. When we talk about IEC 61850, you'll hear protocols like Goose protocols and whatever that need to converge faster than a fraction of a cycle of power, you know, 50 uh, hertz wow. or in Australia, 60 hertz in North America. Um, therefore, the IEDs that monitor the system need to be able to communicate large volumes of information and converge quickly. So the networks themselves have to be able to perform that way. And as we take this into the mining environment, we take it underground, we distribute it, um, we need to be able to accommodate that into our mine designs. So tell, let's talk a little bit about that architecture, right? Because um, what you're talking about is I don't know that we see that requirement anywhere else in the mine, not that fast a convergence, right? We, we've talked about uh, sensitivity to, you know, uh, roaming and reconvergence and wireless when we're talking autonomous vehicles and that kind of thing. But that's a whole different level than you're talking about now where we're talking sub-second, like a sub-cycle, right, on the power side. Can that still all be one network? Or is are these really bespoke networks from each other? Um, the, the issue is when we look at an IEC 61850 design, we look at a core network, and then we look at um, when we get down into the substation themselves and the control network of the substation. Um, your convergence time nearly a lot, well, your architecture aligns similarly to what you would have in a process control network with a SCADA network at the top yeah. with less convergence requirements. We try and keep it down into the sub 50 millisecond type nature. We just, we can do that. We, we, we achieve that. But once we get down into the substation communication where um, the um, substations across a mine need to be interconnected, they're going to be connected to layer two. Why? Because these protocols are non-routable, the ones we talked about before, right. like Goose. Um, so first design is uh, layer two. They need to be deployed on, uh, well, tip, well, they should be deployed on a high availability access network design. These are uh, protocols like HSR, high-speed route convergence, uh, HSR protocol, IEC, standard again, or... Um, Oh, what's a P, uh, parallel redundancy protocol where I have two parallel networks run side by side. The devices send two copies of the packets out both ways. The answer is specific designs for power control systems. Now, if we look at it in the, in the terms of uh, mining, we take power generation out, meaning off-site power generation, the SCADA systems much looks the same, maybe segmented by function, if that's the way you want it. Right. They can run on a common infrastructure. Uh, if you're running them separately, uh, long lines, wider in network to central generation, you might run a central MP an MPLS network and you may use the MPLS network to do multiple systems. So you can have segmentation there. But where you're now at the mine site itself, uh, what difference is the process control network will go off into its architecture, it can have a mixture of uh, IP layer three packets in SCADA and we get down to the control layer. Now it depends on where are you on your evolution of control. So there we mm -hmm. may see 
uh, Profinet or DLR rings for ODVA in the control system, in the control networks. There's non-routable protocols down there too, sometimes like Ethercat and other legacy systems, or we've made the networks rely on broadcasts and multicasts, maybe a longer conveyor belt where I need to broadcast quickly um, uh, tags from PLC to one another. But in a structured design, we could say some industries starting off mine, starting greenfields may start layer three all the way down to the access or control layer. But anyway, that's the SCADA and the control process control okay. network. On the IEC 6150, once we're at that aggregation layer, um, we start feeding out to the control systems for the control buses of high voltage distribution. We're looking at layer two HSR and parallel redundancy protocol network designs. What it does bring to bear though is another interesting design variable is we now have lots of dependency on high resolution and high availability clocks. So we have the process control network with um, uh, Annex uh, G1588 V2 uh, standards. We have um, C37 standards of protocols for power profile clock. And we might even have a private LTE or a network like that where we're getting telco profile clock. And we also have other supplementary systems in mining, like underground, we'll have seismic systems, which require a clock, a high resolution clock. Now, what's been happening is these clocks have been put in all over the place, uh, usually feedback to GPS. Um, but there's a, some thought to be thought about how do I build high resolution, accurate, multi-purpose clocks that are replicated that be able to feed in. So there's lots of interesting design. Design a fiber layout to accommodate these new physical topologies for the requirements for the network. My segmentation model, my clocking model, how do I build a highly available networks in themselves? Can I share or will they be separate? And some of those are technology focused and then other ones are actually organizational focused. Have I set myself up for an environment where production and infrastructure services, maybe traditionally called IT, uh, different organizations have different domains of management, or have I federated them together and said, no, no, there is just production, and what we're IT is now embedded in and providing infrastructure support for what are what is essentially internet technologies, which is underpinning all of this. Right. Internet technologies, packet technologies are all coming into this mix. And of course, with that, internet technology's great benefit is rapid, fast moving ability to execute. The downside of that is it loves to talk. It's free and open communication with everyone and therefore security is much by my next biggest threat. So good security design, and that's across everything. And they're, even, they're in our sectorial designs, whether it be the CVDs, Cisco validated designs for industry, such as GRID. We're definitely more security in there. We're doing it in process control networks and, and we bring them together, mining networks as well. No different. So wow. lots of things well, moving. <laughs> <laughs> it's all so good. Fascinating about all of this stuff you just talked about. This is... Uh, I mean, there's a lot there. Would the would the people who've been designing uh, control networks for mines, the engineering companies that that normally would be involved in this, that would maybe be more uh, control system experts, um, would they have the same skill set? Like, is it or is it, is it typically the same companies that know how to do power systems and know about these? Um, resilient protocols that you talked about, like how how commonplace is this stuff or is this something new that mining companies need to probably procure differently? No, look, I would say in every aspect, if power systems companies can do power systems networks, not a problem, Okay. right? Process control people are well, uh, are well uh, versed into and know how to do process control systems. Um, right. The difference is, though, is how do you bring them together as they may have to in the, in the area where we say, let's put the technology aside. What's driving this is variable power 
into a production system which now needs to cater for a variable power source. Where in the past, oh, I may have been able to design them as separate infrastructure and not get away, but comfortably operate a mine that way. As I bring this in, I now need more close alignment uh, across uh, the different components of my infrastructure. How you do that, that is something that Cisco has developed expertise in within the networking, security, and operations of infrastructure itself, right? Um, so we believe we've got a part to play and we have capabilities, and it's largely as a result of where we, our expertise and, and the area which we, we deal in the market but also by our exposure and work that we're having to solve these problems for grid operators, these problems right. for manufacturing systems, these yeah. problems for cities, these problems for mining. And what Cisco has is a group of people and, and focus on products that are focused on the mining industry. Um, with inside yeah. our sphere of, uh, of, of knowledge, uh, we have uh, much to offer in this area. And like all these things, we have templates and designs. And I joke internally, I say, uh, many people are like a fashion house that say this goes with this and these are designs, but it all comes down to the tailoring around each mine. Right. Because each place in mine, each mine itself is unique and different. So... What yeah. works here may have to be adapted in small ways. The architecture is the same. The architecture, high-level design are common, but the low-level designs that we come for the geometries of, you know, am I talking about a um, block caving mine? Am I doing conventional stope underground? Uh, do I have one pit or do I have multiple pits? Uh, do I have multiple mines and I wish to operate this for all mines as a going concern with one remote operations centre? All these things need to be tweaked and optimised for that environment. But the good news is... So that um, macro engineering thing that you talked about is actually really, really critical. Um, yeah. you, you can't kind of do all these pieces in isolation. They have to kind of work. Oh, no, no. I mean. A thousand random acts of violence don't add up to a good, uh, a good harmonious infrastructure. What you typically end up <laughs> saying is, um, in the future, I can't do that now because the network says no, right? They're the old right. adage. Or, or you say, if I knew then what I knew now, our goal is to build flexible architectures that accommodate change. We can't. We don't know what all the change will be, but we know the characteristics of all these systems themselves and what they need to do. And then we need to map that back to an organisational model within the organisations, because organisation structure with operations needs to be be, be aligned as well. So. As you said, is there one organization? I would say maybe not one organization. They could build a system. But can you, can right. you do the transportation? Can you do the high availability? Can you do the virtualization? Can you do the security? Can you do the operations? Do you understand mining versus another industry? You know, your number of people shrinks, right? Uh, we've developed right. the capability here, largely working in association alongside our customers that give us access to look at the big problems. And then uh, we've aligned ourselves through our, uh, uh, industry solutions groups to actually go and address custom-made solutions for industry, where some of the technologies are common, but how you apply them to solve the problems and unique problems of those industries are very specific. And what I'm saying is mining is a aggregation of all of those and therefore right. is also interesting. Specific. <clears throat> I, I'm curious, I'm curious, Michael, with, um, uh, I've heard some people say that kind of digitization is really the key to having, to creating that flexibility or that agility. Um, how, how does, how does that work? Like does, is digitization really that key because you know, maybe contrast a little bit kind of how things used to be done and then how they're being done now with a digital infrastructure and why that creates a more agile environment. Or um, maybe I'd like your thoughts on that anyway. Oh, well, digitization is a very 
big word. It's a it's a it's a simple word that has a very wide dimension. So look, digitization right. is the fundamental equation that's required to automate. Right? I can't. It's very hard. You can have simple automation analog form, but we need digital form to put on control systems and automate right from basic capability right through to full automation autonomous capability. So digitization is key. But digitization also means can I expand uh, largely what that meant in the past? Well, I'll talk about, we're going to go back into long history now, but we'll talk about conventional. Control, conventional control systems, wired control, those things are digitized, right? They're under uh, programmatic control. It could argue as to whether you have single systems coordinated or whether I've implemented multiple different systems, right? Uh, and, and the issue is how are they all coming together, common SCADA systems and control and, and plant management systems themselves. But digitization and common data, common data sets, uh, common tags <laughs> and interpretation of that is vital. But that's all state of the art, right? What's interesting now is you saw that where it said, and that was with IoT, which was, I now need to extend my sense of reach. I want data further afield. And right. the first part of IoT was, what I, and this is me talking and my interpretation, what I call enterprise IoT. I gather some data off of a, it may be a, a, a pump, a vibration, and I send it to the cloud and I model it the digital twin model, and then eventually I make some decision and then change my process. Uh, that I would call enterprise-based, and that's uh, people have evolved. We think, we think we're now out of the pilot and experimentation phase. It's now being deployed in earnest for how we do that. In mining, what do we see? We see people putting sensors on vehicles at the beginning of the mine process to understand the impact of the life of mine costs and operation of that vehicle, right? The full cost, and it goes into the full mine model. But we now see it further apart. Uh, can I, my tailings dam monitoring, my environmental monitoring, my dust suppression, all the things that are, maybe I have access to my sensors, but I've got to get input from others, correlate that, and then have something happen, like turn the sprinklers on to suppress the dust, maybe at the port where I'm not allowed to, to do that or uh, make certain I'm not discharging anything which violates my uh, environmental um, regulation uh, contracts with government. But um, what we're now starting to see is control systems people want access to that data as well. And we may need to be able to do things in, in real time, in which case it's no longer enterprise, it's just production. It's still yeah. classified as IoT by technology or type. But now we need an architecture which can accommodate the data coming in, coming into the control layer, and then forwarding it up to the enterprise, right? And there's some interesting designs that come out of that. Like, could I have my DMZ, my, my demilitarized zone in the cloud? And there are Cisco's white papers on that, right? So mm -hmm. this is all evolving. So what I would say is yeah. digitization, yes, it's the premise, it's the beginning, but how... What you do with that data, whether you do it in an enterprise model or if it's a production model, or maybe you've just digitized and you have automation in silos. And lots of my customers are now looking and saying, well, how do I have those systems interoperate? Which is the premise of what we talked about today. And now EMS, yeah. an energy management system, closely coupled with process control system uh, in the moment of production to understand and make a decision that's optimized for both. Okay, as right. opposed to, I now guarantee that I have a mainline base load capability of this much generation at all time. And then if it's not there, I just fall back into this state. Now we have a variable, or maybe perhaps a variable production state all the way through a variable production mix based on environmental factors like wind or solar, mm -hmm. or solar input or whatever, or battery capacity state or whatever we have. Um, and then yeah, the I guess security model that runs with that as well, okay? Yeah, I, I guess if safety, all of these safety systems, systems are all represented <laughs> by data sets, then really in, in the interactions between them becomes much more adjustable as well, right? Um, but like you said, security becomes way more important. 
point. It has to really be integrated into the whole thing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's right. fascinating. And, and, and it, it works for all facets of, of mining, um, whether it is uh, improvements in productivity, whether it's improvements in safety capability to locate people or um, or activate or deactivate systems where they are. Um, whether it is uh, the ability to optimize for cost or uh, yield, right? These are all now factors of equations coming in, which is leading to this. That's when you when you started the beginning of this interview. Well, what's happening? And, and Greenfield's mind is starting to think completely different. Where you know uh, we would typically build up a template. I need an energy. I need a process control network. I need. I need. I need. And templates would come in. Now we're starting to see, well, more, with more integrated capabilities, they need to be, what does that look like? Right? We have facets from other industries about where we could apply and maybe some genuine new innovation to be applied as well for uh, people that are looking at, and like I said, the battery-operated locomotives is new work, right? Uh, but what starts out there, maybe with some uh, of the major mining companies around the world, may end up being um, mainstream later, okay, in other industries. Hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael. For more information on Cisco and the mining industry, check out cisco.com slash go slash mining. Take care.